Hey everyone, Jolt here. Today is the final closeout session of cohort six of the visual thinking workshop where we all read Playing to Win, How Strategy Really Works by Roger L. Martin and we all created our book on a page summaries. This video is going to be a demonstration of my book on a page summary which this time around is more of a worksheet, a strategy worksheet that you can download and fill out for yourself. I've actually given this a test drive. I went through and filled out this worksheet with material about my online business and I found it a super useful exercise. So if you follow the video, you understand the basic concepts from the book as well as how to fill out this worksheet and you can also download the worksheet from a link in the video description. Now before we dive in to what strategy is and how it works, let's talk about some of the ineffective ways and approaches to strategy. So the first ineffective approach is treating strategy as a vision or stopping at the vision level. A vision is not yet a strategy. It's an important part of the strategy, but it's not the strategy alone. Equally, people talk about strategic plans, which according to Roger is really not a good term. A plan is not a strategy, as you can see in the bottom right corner. A detailed plan may actually not add up to a long-term competitive, sustainable competitive advantage. Also, benchmarking to others and trying to imitate others in the industry is not a strategy. Sameness is not a strategy, as well as following best practices or trying to do everything at the same time. And finally, the point that Roger makes that this idea that the business and the world is changing so fast that we are unable to create a strategy, we are going to have an emergent strategy. He doesn't believe in this. The more uncertain the situation, the more you need a strategy because that is going to guide decisions how you're going to approach your business. So in the book, Roger talks about the strategic cascade and essentially according to Roger strategy is an integrated and coordinated set of five choices starting with defining your winning aspirations then talking about where to play how to play once these are defined you can move on to talk about core capabilities and finally the management systems that will help you keep on track with your strategy. And as you can see from the arrows here and from the spiral in the top right, strategy is an iterative process. It's about thinking about one aspect of the strategy and then revisiting another part of your strategy, making sure that these parts play in concert with each other. It's about choices and as you make your choices, you narrow down your options and that's how you come to a strategy. The other point here is that strategy, if you're talking about a big organization, of course, if you're a one man shop, then this is different. But if you talk about a big organization, then strategy happens at multiple layers in the organization. And these strategic cascades will affect one another. They will build on one another and you need to think about that cascading effect as well. So now let's look at each of these five steps in the cascade. Let's look at some of the best practices that are outlined in the book. Starting with winning aspirations. First of all, you should craft a deep purpose-driven aspiration, something that is really close to your heart. And you should start that aspiration not from a product perspective, but from a customer perspective. Customers should be at the center. When you're playing, you should have aspirations to win, not just to play. Here, I would just mention in brackets that reading the Infinite Game by Simon Sinek, as well as reading Finite and Infinite Games by James P. Cars. I'm not sure I fully 
agree with the statements made by Roger here because defining the rules of the game unilaterally and defining based on what criteria I'm going to win is not really winning. But I get the idea in the book that you shouldn't be just playing around. If you're in business, you should be there to make a difference. You should be there to win in the area that you've selected to be in or to participate in. As you consider winning and as you consider your strategy, be mindful of the unexpected competitors and think of cascading your aspirations down to your functions, to your brands, to your lines, again, if you're a big organization. And finally, don't stop here. Aspirations are not yet strategy. They're just the first step in defining your strategy. Once you have your aspiration clear, then you can think about where you want to play. And where is in a very broad sense. So this where can be in terms of geography, it can be in terms of supply chain, it can be in terms of customer segment or distribution channel or customer needs, price tier, whatever. There are lots of ways to define where you want to play, but you need to be clear on where you want to play and you need to seek niches where you are able to win. This means that you actually want to look for the path of least resistance. So you want to compete smartly. You don't want to open multiple fronts. You don't want to attack the strong established player head on. And you should always be cautious when you find a niche that seems to be empty. Probably there is someone you just didn't notice who that is because you were not familiar with the niche. And finally, choosing to play everywhere is not a choice. Then you didn't make a choice. You need to think through where you want to play. You cannot be successful playing everywhere. Once you know where you want to play, you need to think about how you want to win. And you need to create choices and we'll talk about these choices later on in the reverse engineering as we talk about that in a couple of minutes. If you are not able to create winning choices, then you should get out of that game and look for another game. Also, as you think about how to win, you need to align it with where to play. So for example, if you're deciding to play in the premium segment of your customer base, then probably the how to play doing sales, low cost sales and promotions is not the right how to play. You probably need to bring, build up brand prestige and do uh, things like that. So when you know where you want to play, you need to align that with how you want to play. As you think about how to play, be mindful that the dynamics of the game may change. Your competitors are also playing. You always need to keep your eyes open to see how the competitive landscape is changing. If you're not winning, then go back and think about the rules and modify the rules in a way that you are going to be able to win. And when you think about how to win choices, then think also in these choices for your non-customer facing business units as well, your functions. Once you know your aspirations, you know where you want to play and how you want to play, then you need to start to think about your capabilities. You need to define your essential capabilities at, that are the same across your organization and that build on one another. Don't overthink this. So it is not so important what's critical and what's not. If something seems critical, you should do that. The important point in the book is about creating a unique set of capabilities. Your aspirations, your where to play and how to play choices can be easily mimicked by your competitors, but your core capabilities are extremely hard to replicate. That is your long-term competitive advantage. So make sure 
that you build a unique system. As you build your unique system, reverse engineer the activity system of your competitors and make sure that you have a better system. And as you look at your own capabilities, do a realistic assessment and do tests for feasibility so you're not surprised by living in La La Land and then you go out to the real world to execute your capabilities. And finally, you need to create management systems to keep you on track in terms of your strategic journey. This means that you want to build a rhythm of talking about strategy and revisiting your choices. You want very clear and simple communication to your organization so people understand what the strategy is. You want to create metrics so that you can measure that you're developing your core capabilities. And you want to also create metrics that will measure your strategic choices. So in a nutshell, these are the five elements of the strategic cascade. Next to these five elements in the strategic cascade, the book contains two additional valuable resources. One is the logic flow. And the logic flow is simply this process of thinking through segmentation, structure, customer and channel, capabilities and costs, how your competitors are likely to react and creating strategic choices based on this assessment. The other tool that's in the book is called reverse engineering. And reverse engineering is about framing issues as choices. Roger highlights that unless you're able to create a choice out of an issue, it is really not going to be clear to people what the issue is. So you need to try to frame your issues as choices. Then you need to generate strategic possibilities for those choices. This is how you get to this core question of what would have to be true. And we're going to come back to this in just one second. Once you've answered what would have to be true for each of these strategic possibilities, then you need to identify the barriers to each of these and define tests, how you can test these barriers and then start these tests, execute these tests in a way that you test the weakest barrier first, because then you can quickly filter out the options that are really not feasible because they failed on the first test. Now, in terms of this question, what would have to be true? This was a revelation to Roger and he talks about this quite extensively in the book. The point is, instead of arguing on what is true and what not is true, it's much better to have an argument about what would have to be true. So you take a strategic possibility and you play the logic flow backwards. So you think about what will or how will your competitors react? What are they going to do? And then you think about what you need to have, what needs to be true about your capabilities, your costs, your channels, customers, etc., for this strategic option to be viable. And you work yourself backwards based on this logic to validate different strategic possibilities. So with that, now let's spend just a few minutes talking about how I think you should be filling out this form. It's really very simple. So you should fill in the table following the sequence of numbers. So you first fill in winning aspirations, then where to play and so on. We're going to look at this in one second. And as you fill this out, you should use the logic flow and the reverse engineering tools to guide your thinking. So how does this work? You start with defining your winning aspirations under point number one. Once you've defined that, you move on to think about where to play. You think about customer segment, geography, products, etc. And when you've made up your mind about your where to play, you go back 
and you look at your winning aspirations again and you write down any additional thoughts or modifications that came up regarding your winning aspirations. And when you're done with that, then you move on to how to win and you fill out your ideas about how you want to win your choices. That will trigger a revisit of where to play and your aspirations and so on. This is how you go through this worksheet all the time recircling back to previous points and refining your aspirations, your where to play, how to play, etc. choices. There are six traps that you should try to avoid. Avoid the do-it-all strategy, that's just simply not going to work. Avoid attacking walled cities, meaning don't attack established strong players. Don't open multiple fronts because you're not going to win if you fight on multiple fronts. Don't try to meet everyone's requirement. You cannot play in all the geographies, all the customer segments everywhere at once. The end will be you're unhappy and your customers are unhappy. Don't develop aspirations that you are not able to translate into strategic choices. And finally, avoid the program of the month approach where you simply follow what's trendy in your business and each month you target something else based on what your competitors are doing. And finally, you have a good strategy. You know you have a good strategy when you see that your activity system looks different from your competitors. It's unique. When you have customers who love you, who adore you, but you also have non-customers who just simply don't understand why would anyone buy from you. There you have competitors who actually make a good profit because A, they're less likely to attack you. B, it seems that you made some good strategic choices which actually left some niches open for others to play in. Then you have freedom to outspend your competitors on resources because this means that your value equation is working well. When your competitors attack one another and you're the laughing third party, you know that you're perceived to be strong and this is a good position to be in. And finally, you know you have a good strategy when customers are looking to you for innovations and for whatever is new. So that is my book on a page summary and the strategic worksheet for playing to win. If you're interested, I encourage you to download this. I'll have a version in Excolid Draw and a version as a higher resolution PNG file. You can download this, you can print it, or you can fill it out on your PC. That's up to you. And finally, if you're interested in creating a similar book on a page summary and to learn about visual thinking with Excolid Draw and Obsidian, then please look at the link below and consider joining cohort seven of the visual thinking workshop. Thank you.